Well, there's three reasons, really, Yukon's in global focus. Number one is Snowline's 7 million plus ounce uh, valley discovery. And let's get right to it. Everyone knows the location. It's in the eastern part of the Tombstone Gold Belt, the salmon color within that larger, broader Tintina Gold Belt. But really what it comes down for us is that plus 300,000 ounce per year producers are relatively rare. There's 25 mines that produced that much. There's another 13 mines that are exceptionally rare. They produce over 500,000 ounces per year. So Snowline's Valley Discovery, based on our research and our model, has got that production potential. If you look at the market success, it's really impressive. 528% return since June 17th, 2022, when the visual results came out from the company in terms of the um, visible gold, the vein density and everything. So we covered it fairly quickly after going to site, but you're getting plus 500 gram meter intercepts uh, on the back of that visual. Uh, B2 Gold strategic investment shortly thereafter into 2023, they topped up their investment towards 10%. Uh, again, you know, 500 gram meter intercept. We went full coverage last year at the, uh, at the Yukon property tours. 1,000 gram meter intercept. Um, another 600 gram meter intercept. And these are, these are numbers that the senior mining companies track and uh, are a great proxy for size and economic viability. And then uh, Snowline put out their resource recently at 7.3 million ounces at just under 1.5 grams, but an $880 million market cap. And just back to that production profile based on our model, and we did a proper mineral inventory, little pit and things like that, and discounted cash flow. Um, this is that profile for 500,000 ounces per year. It's really leveraged by 650,000 ounces a year from a starter pit. Low strip, high grade, um, and anybody getting out to snow line will see that tomorrow in, in a lot of detail. I think it's tomorrow. Number two reason is critical minerals. Um, Western Copper and Gold's casino project, 3 billion tons, 1 billion tons in reserves, uh, feasibility, about to go through the permitting process. Um, that is uh, globally very, very significant. Add on to the top of that, Fireweed's Mac Pass project, lead zinc, and Mac Tung, the tungsten project. Very important in this environment with the critical minerals tailwinds we have. So let's focus a little bit on the undeveloped plus two billion uh, pound copper undeveloped projects, sorry, uh, globally. And there's really not that many either. Um, there's Casino up in Northwest, B uh, no, sorry, in the Yukon. And let's look at it in terms of junior controlled assets. It's number one in size at 27.5 billion tons of copper equivalent. You can see the breakdown in orange being copper, yellow being gold, Molly in blue there. <clears throat> when you look at in terms of Canada's uh, production assets, casino on the um, left here. If it was in production, one of the lowest cash cost producers at a, about a dollar fifty per pound. That's the gray circle there, and it would be on a copper equivalent basis bigger than Highland Valley, and it would be number two if it was just on copper. You can see across we've got Mount Milligan, Gibraltar, Red Chris, um, Copper Mountain, and New, and New Afton. So that's really important. It's Canada's biggest uh, critical minerals asset by GDP and a number of other metrics. Normally I would put some free cash flow up here to show what the project look like, looks like, but I think it's really important given there's an electrification push from BC, a grid connect, at least a political initiative and discussion, that if casino was in production, um, it would pay for the grid connect in terms of the government free tax cash flow, or free uh, tax cash flows. So early on it's plus 300 million, but life of mine, 27 years, it's plus 240 million per year. And these are US dollars uh, that would support the Yukon economy. So casinos had a conceptual lock on grade, I think, uh, over time. As I, I researched it and launched coverage last year, I found surprisingly uh, there is a very good high-grade heart to the deposit. 689 meters at 1% copper, 
I think if a junior put that in the Yukon these days, say in Casino's location, there'd be quite a market reaction. And that's exactly what happened in 1993, through the heart of the deposit. So even though there's a, you know, average grades, life of mine, might be closer to 0.2.2 .2 .2 in terms of gold copper, there is this low strip ratio and fantastic high grade, heart to the deposit. Hence, the interest in Rio and Mitsubishi. So 858, sorry, 858 meters at 1.4% copper equivalent. Well, that's exactly what Velo published, Adam Lundin's here today, amongst his team, and a 12-month return on that, over 400%, market cap drove up to plus uh, 2.4 billion on the basis of that. So this is, this is, sometimes it's about timing, sometimes it's about conceptual lock, in my view. Let's pivot to fireweed. Um, just a slide here to uh, portray this uh, district, 50 kilometers long about, uh, that's had some uh, game-changing discoveries in terms of boundary. It's augmented by uh, Mac Tung uh, as well in terms of the tungsten critical mineral side of things. But this is a belt that uh, I've been told is going to receive a very, very strong exploration budget on the back of the $43 million raise. Uh, very th strong thrust on the regional side to make sure the biggest deposits have been found um, aside from Tom Jason boundary. So this is a new uh, proto district. Um, you can see the fertile corridor in purple and that will be the subject of a lot of uh, geochemistry and um, gravity and other techniques to find spectacular deposits. I think one of the top dis uh, intercepts, lead zinc intercepts globally in the last 15 plus years, 124 meters. Uh, uh, just over 12% zinc, over a percent lead, and about 46 grams of gold. Within that, 60 meters of almost 20% zinc. The Mayo District, plus 20 million ounces, with 9.3 million ounces discovered just since 2020. Um, I think everyone knows where it is, um, and really focus in on the area that has really good infrastructure. That's where, uh, you know, you, you can leverage lower grade production. And between all the producers and players here, uh, they've got the power line and excess power. I think everyone was on the site visit the other day could see how relatively easy it is uh, compared to some of these projects that are a little bit farther away, more remote. Let's switch gears a little bit and look at uh, the Yukon strategic positioning and impact of the last few years in terms of um, these three uh, aspects. Equity raised. In 2022, about 135. Last year, 115. Year to date, we're already at 170 for the Yukon. And 43% of that was raised in June. So it's been big, chunky raises in June. In terms of drilling, it looks like it's probably flat year on year between 23 and 24. 160, these numbers are partly from Yukon Geological Survey. Thank you, Sarah. And then the expiration spend is trending about the same as well, maybe 140 plus minus. I'm sure it'll be higher that, than that by the end of the year again. Thank you to Sarah, Yukon Geological Survey. But let's look at Yukon in the context of BC and Alaska. Now you look at the trends, BC coming down substantially between 22 and 24 year to date. Uh, Alaska in gray, really a shadow of what the Yukon is drawing in terms of investor interest. In 2024, uh, equity raised just about $40 million. So uh, Yukon has raised four times that amount. So again, the global focus on the Yukon uh, certainly is there in terms of the equity raised. Strategic investments, uh, big strategic investments about 2022 and 2023. Year to date, maybe not so many from the seniors, but from the Lundin family, big chunky investments and in supporting this jurisdiction you know, in, in connection with tier one type targets. Um, let's look at the seniors in 2012. You can see in the map, uh, Yukon, basically, uh, Golden Triangle had a couple. Uh, Barrick, a legacy interest in Eskay Creek, and also Tech had Glore Creek. Quite a few seniors in Alaska, but zero in the Yukon in terms of strategic investments and other interests. Let's fast forward to today and you've got eight. So a lot of the positive things have been happening in the Yukon to drive that. 
I think part of it's the Golden Triangle down in BC. Part of it's the infrastructure, part of it's First Nations alignment. But underpinning uh, a lot of this for the Yukon is very, very good geology, very fertile geology and permissive geology. Number of funds in, uh, <clears throat> I had an animation here, but I guess we took it up. Um, interesting from 2022, and this is scraping fact set, going from just over 50 funds to now over 100 with exposure uh, to Yukon. So it's also attracted the institutional investors amongst all the companies, except for, uh, we didn't include Heckler or Newmont. Coverage up, I think it's important to have analyst coverage. Uh, it's gone up dramatically from, I think, about plus minus 16 to uh, about 32. So the sell side has stepped up. You can see a number of companies getting a lot more coverage. Uh, Snowline being the big one, going from one to nine. Um, so that's another proxy for interest in the Yukon and attention that the capital markets are giving to the Yukon. So double the coverage. Tailwinds, which I'm gonna focus on. I think, I think it, Yukon on fire status has been there with a lot of this momentum over the last few years. Uh, flow through financing, critical minerals financing has absolutely been really important, especially versus say Alaska doesn't have that advantage. Uh, we haven't really seen the money flow in from the Canadian government on critical minerals or the U.S. government, but that's probably going to happen. I think that is going to happen probably in 2025, an election year. We're in a global risk-off environment, therefore the Yukon is, is a safe jurisdiction and a proto-tier one jurisdiction in my view. And asymmetric leverage to the, uh, the Canadian dollar. Commodity prices, obviously, there's a tailwind there, especially with gold, copper, and zinc. And there is really a frontier allure to tier one greenfield discoveries. The, uh, I think uh, Byron gave a great presentation on the lack of exploration and the Yukon, relatively speaking, need to be persistent. <clears throat> and then I want to show this chart because I think it's important that there's been a real change in Canada and Alaska in terms of open pit uh, mines, gold mines in particular. So you can see here, up until 1997, there was virtually no production. It was all in Timmins, really small operations. Everything changed in 1997 with Fort Knox. And then Canadian Malartic at Cisco and Deter Gold, and it's gone from there. And in the pipeline in Canada, there is Cote Lake, there's Skeen is Eske, there's Artemis, Blackwater. So a number of projects, and then if you look far, far enough out, you'll have certainly a snow line uh, with Valley, in our view. And, and you, know, you could put Casino on there, too, if you want to be mixing in the copper golds. So Yukon key, uh, company key success factors, certainly with my lens, there's a Yukon DNA that I think a lot of the CEOs, management teams have. I think that's important in terms of uh, you know, developing those First Nations relationships that are very important, understanding uh, how to work in the Yukon. I think there's uh, a number of CEOs that can uh, attest to that, and you've probably met them throughout the conference, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the site visits and otherwise. The right geology, the right slice of geology, it's obviously very important. Uh, maximizing shots on goal, allocating capital to those drill holes. Um, cost per meter really goes up when you get more remote, so you've got to target very effectively. You also have a seasonality, and that's the key, is to mar have a marketing strategy to maintain a low cost of capital to bridge that seasonality as drill results come in. And persistence, I think Ron Burdell is probably the the example of persisting the prospector family with Scott and family for 30 years, um, persevering and leveraging a database into a phenomenal discovery, the Valley Discovery, under a public company roof. So those are the three reasons for me, uh, you kind of global focus. I would add though to marketing uh, between the government and YMA, uh, very unique to have this type of site visit, uh, one week, concentrated site visits, very efficient, uh, lots of time in the air and stuff like that, but the chance for investors and media analysts to see a lot of the Yukon and get a chance to really be uh, digesting it. You don't see that in other jurisdictions that I'm aware of, and politically there's lots of access to fairly high-level officials, ministers, and the premier, as you saw from the dinner. Same thing for Beaver Creek, 
um, and other uh, venues, international venues, where the Yukon's been really on its front foot. Last slide, globally plus 100 gram meter intercepts. That's one of our primary filters for assets we want to start to look at. In red, this is the Tintina Gold Belt. This is primarily uh, the Yukon, a little bit of Alaska, and it's actually primarily snow line. So there's some Sitka there. Um, number one in the world right next to this, the Guyana Shield. So Suriname, French Guiana, and Guyana. That's really impressive. This is just in the last 12 months. So 46 intercepts. And then it goes from there into the Abbot Tibby, the Golden Triangle, very prolific as well. That's one of our batting cages. That's why it's blue. And then going down from there, and here's central Lapland uh, in Finland. Almost no outcrop, a little bit diff more difficult to explore there. So I, I will disclose, uh, you know, independent research firm. Uh, this was information only, and there's our coverage list and disclosure, which I'm sure will be, you'll be able to access. Uh, thank you very much.